Everybody. All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome back. Oh, okay, as I was just warning everybody here, tonight's going to be rough since it's been two months. I'm not in the practice of doing these. And I forgot about eating a full slice of Carrie's cake, which I finished really quick. So now am I in a food coma and and everything else. So uh, speaking of which, let's show them what they're missing out on. This is the uh, trademark Carrie Groomer's Delicious Chocolate Cherry Delight. That's what, is that what we're calling it? That's what we're calling it. All right, that's what I'm calling it. All right, it was, it was delicious. I think it, it, was, it took all about a minute and a half. Oh. You're not getting any sound. Oh, see. We're having issues. Having issues already. We're getting, you're not getting any sound? <laughs> Testing one, two. Very good. No, I All right, let's see. I got sugar, so I shouldn't. You can hear? Yeah, I can hear. Testing one, two. Yeah, it's supposed to be going out. Okay, oh, it looks like it's just my mom. <laughs> All right, well. My mom is not getting sound, but June is, so. You might be on mute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, hopefully well, you can all hear, so that's good. So June has sound. We're good. Okay, so here's the plan. And this could change. So this might look a lot different next week. We'll see how it goes. But uh, when I threw it out there to uh, see what we wanted to talk about, um, I, I mentioned that one of the thoughts was, you know, look at the Book of Concord. Perfectly fine. I've done that many times. Um, well, First of all, looking at the Book of Concord is fine. You have to understand that the Book of Concord is a collection of several books. There's the Augsburg Confession, the Apology to the Confession, the Power and Primacy of the Pope, Large and Small Catechism. You've got a collection of books that make up the Book of Concord, Formula of Concord, Small Called Articles. Now, each individual thing is, is great. There's a lot of good stuff, but it's just, it's a lot. So usually when I talk about going through the Book of Concord, it's usually just like going through one of them the small call articles, the, the Augsburg Confession. That's enough. <laughs> Believe me, that's enough. Um, but then a, 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 a thought was put out there that it is dense. And honestly, even going through the Apology or the Augsburg Confession, it is dense. It is very, I mean, it's a lot. And so it, you can break it down pretty easily. But I thought, you know, we, we could do that. We can break it down. We can do a summary. Easy peasy. But then I started to think, well, to really understand what was going on there, you've got to understand the context because, you know, the, the Reformation and what was being argued about, you know, we usually come to it in very simplistic terms like, oh, you know, Luther didn't like the Catholic Church. You know, the Catholic Church was abusing things. Well, it's true. But there was a little bit more complexity to it. Um, Luther didn't want to break away. He did want to reform. Um, there's a fun realization once you look back even before Luther is that everything that Luther was kind of railing against, there were people before Luther who were saying the same thing. In fact, the ones who said it before Luther met untimely ends <laughs> because they were considered heretics. Um, Luther just happened to bring this up at the right time, in the right place, in all the right set of circumstances to spark this reformation. So I thought, well, you know, if we're really going to do this justice, we've got to give at least a little bit of context. <laughs> At that point, I'm like, well, to really understand what's going on there, you've got to go back a little bit further. So what I settled on was let's give you a little bit of church history. Go right back to after the book of Acts and move forward. Now, there's a lot of territory to cover, so it wouldn't be like zeroing in and looking at, you know, detailed stuff, but just sort of an overview of, like, three or four different eras leading into the Reformation. So we could probably cover, broadly speaking, Acts to the Reformation in three or four sessions. Um, so it would be basically history, which is not everybody's cup of tea. Um, it could be a little dry. However, I think it's pretty interesting, <laughs> and I hope I can make it interesting. So um, what I've got tonight is uh, looking at the early church, so basically everything from the apostles, so ending with Acts, to 250 AD, okay? So this is the early church period. 
we're going to look at that, and there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of stuff we can cover. In my brief summary, I've got about 10 pages of an outline. Um, but, and, and you know, if, if you don't like history, cool. <laughs> it can be a little bit dry, I get that. But I think what we'll find as, you, as we get into this tonight is that there is a lot of very, um, th there's a lot that can apply to us today. And it, you actually begin to see a lot of the, the groundwork for some of the issues that Luther was facing, why things were the way they were in Luther's day, why things are the way they are today. And we're still dealing with some of the same stuff that the early church was dealing with. Um, so I think it, I, well, like I said, I think it's fascinating, interesting. There's some, there's some good stuff here. So my, my, my offer is this. Make it through tonight and then be brutally honest with me Wow, that was fun. Let's go with this. Yes, I want to learn more. I almost fell asleep. <laughs> it's six o'clock. We had a big piece of cake. This is not going to cut it. <laughs> Let's it just. Chocolate cake. I know it's so good. <laughs> so, if we want to just jump right into more like theology of the Reformation, we can totally do that. Um, but like I said, I think this this background information is really interesting and helpful, not just in understanding the Reformation, but understanding today. Because honestly, most of what we talk about today, you can apply exactly to what's going on today. So, sound good? Cool. Okay. I-250 AD. Um, that's a good question. Because the, the book I'm using lumps it in with the 250 AD. Um, I thought maybe Rome fell or something. Well, that was, um, well, Rome was falling <laughs> um, throughout this whole process. Um, I, you know what? I, in... All my prep work, I didn't even, because, you know, it's not the Council of Nicaea that comes in 300. Um, I'll get back to you on that one. Besides the fact that I'm using a, an e-book, which I hate using. I, I have to wait for me, the real book to get here. Um, I'm old school. i got to have a book. Amen. All right. So the last historical writings we have of Jesus, or anything having to do with the, from the apostles, is 60 AD. This is when, this is basically the, the end of the book of Acts and, and Paul's letters. The last that we have are, are coming around this time. So scripture, the New Testament is, is basically written by 60 AD. Okay? So this is where we're, we're, we're kind of beginning. Like I said, we're going to go to 250 AD. It was, it was kind of interesting because this book the, the first premise it laid out was Christianity begins with Jesus. It's like, well, duh. Um, <laughs> wow, mind-blowing stuff. But the, the point that it, it made, and this is actually very crucial, is that um, Christianity um, is based, the whole concept, everything, is based on God's activity, like God's actual activity in historical time. Yeah, and so why it says like, well, Christianity begins with Jesus. It's like, well, yeah, it really does because it begins with God becoming man, the incarnation, God himself walking on earth, actually God in human, you know, flesh, walking on the earth, um, suffering on the cross and dying, and then rising from the dead. And, the, and it's the resurrection that, that seals it because, I mean, if there's no resurrection, then it's pointless for us to be here. Let's just eat cake and go on our way. Um, but it, that changes everything. And it's very important is because it is actually, it is rooted in historical events. Um, you know, it's kind of like, well, well, yeah, well, you know, you think about a lot of, well, most of the world religions, they're philosophical religions. You know, Buddhism. Buddha was a thinker. He thought a lot of stuff. Um, you know, everything is based on the philosophical musings of, of Buddha. Hinduism started off with f philosophical musings. Now, it, it kind of expanded and brought into all these random sort of divine elements. But at their core, it's like, well, it's, it's, these are, you know, they are ways of seeing things or understanding of things. When you get down to it, you don't say Christianity is a way of thinking. Christianity isn't a philosophy. Christianity is historical you know, God working in history, doing things for our salvation. Um, you know, it, it's grounded in reality. <laughs> so this is kind of an important 
detail. <laughs> um, because, and that's why we kind of start here with 60 AD being like, okay, these are the, the last writings, recollections of this is what happened when Jesus was walking. The eyewitnesses wrote all this stuff down. Because um, Christianity isn't philosophical wondering about things, which is going to be important when we start to get into like combating heresies and whatnot. Because the way we combat heresies is with some philosophical thought. <laughs> um, and this is where things, and you're going to see right, right from the get-go, the waters get muddied real quick. And this is just because of us. <laughs> We're frail human beings, and we have to figure everything out, and we need to know how this all works, and philosophy gets into it, and then... Blah, blah, blah. So it has to start with, with Jesus. Concrete, physical, God working in, in the world. Uh, Jesus born in Bethlehem during the reign of Caesar Augustus, okay? Um, executed under Pontius Pilate. So th these are time periods that we can point to. Now, why was, why was Pilate so keen to keep the peace? Have you ever thought about that? Oh, yeah, he feared the people in Rome. Yes, why? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, Besides just for his job. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right, but there, there, there's more to it. There's a lot, there's more to it because um, basically Jesus, so, you know, Jesus is from zero to, you know, 33, give or take, all right, and we're starting at 60, all right, so here's the timeline. The, so here's, here's zero, right? When was it? Okay, so 31 B.C. This is the beginning of the imperial period of Rome, the, the Roman Empire, okay? Before this, you know, it, it's a lot, this is, so what begins here in, at, you know, basically 30 years before Christ's birth is the beginning of the end for Rome. The imperial period is the last period of Rome before it falls completely. Okay, so before this, um, you know, we, you had the, the city-state um, government structures, the social structures, the Senate, you know, the, the Roman Senate and, and uh, politicians and all that, and they met together and, and all this stuff. Well, what's going on for about 100 years, give or take, before this is a fun guy, Julius Caesar, along with a couple others. Time of civil war. Julius Caesar is a powerful, you know, he's won many uh, campaigns. He's popular. He's very powerful. He wants more power. What do, what do guys in power want? More power. Well, other people want power, so they're starting to fight. So there's a period of civil war, just a breakdown of everything, okay? Everything is kind of broken down in this Roman, um, uh, what, do we, what do we call it? The, the Roman Republic. That's right. So the Roman Republic is crumbled and is just fighting. Julius Caesar basically takes over, <laughs> crushes his enemies, and inaugurates the Roman Empire, 31 BC. So this is, uh, so Julius, Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar, which, you know, Jesus was born in the reign of Augustus Caesar. He brings a period of peace and stability that begins right around 31 BC. So you figure 50, well, 60 years previous to Christ's ministry, Rome had just finally secured peace, stability, okay? So you think about it, you've got Pontius Pilate, who's, you know, overseeing Judea. Not only is he fearful for what might happen to him if he loses control, and just for his own well-being and, and career, whatever. I mean, there's a very real sense, like, we got to keep things peaceful. We just, in, you know, in this last generation, secured peace, after a long period of c civil war. You know, the last thing you want is to devolve into another uprising. So there's a lot of pressure going on for, for them to keep the peace, to make sure everyone is cool. <laughs> um, so, you know, this is kind of, this is all rattling in the back of his head. You know, not only his, his own preservation, but, you know, nobody wants to go down as the one who sparked that fire up again. So this is a, a very tense time. Now Jesus comes into, comes into the scene here, and he's, he's doing his ministry. He's teaching. He's 
preaching. He's doing all this stuff. And basically, um, the, the, the core of his... Um... <laughs> oh, geez, sorry. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> Christianity is based. Um, <laughs> Matt Meyer Huber is making fun of me. Rightfully so. <laughs> so, um, so Jesus comes and he's teaching, and basically what, it get, what the core of his teaching is that people are trying to hide from God, essentially, hide behind laws, hide behind all this stuff that they've kind of constructed, um, that the people weren't listening to God. I mean, that was the core, especially for, like, the Pharisees, right? Um, his big thing is you're not listening to God. You're not following his word. In fact, the whole thing was you are following rules that you devised to interpret God's law so that you could feel better about yourself that you could actually do it or that it felt comfortable to you. So like all these laws that that came into being in order to protect the people, to make it so that they could maybe, you know, like, oh, don't worry. you. And and, this is where our Sunday mornings are, are fun because (laughs) <laughs> where I'm coming from <laughs> is that we can't keep the law and that's the hardcore thing and, and we have a discussion in there about well you know but you, you should and it's, it's very fun it's different these two different outlooks but um, the reality is this is what Jesus came to say is like look you have constructed laws that you're saying this is what God wants us to follow but no these laws are just to make you feel better about redefining it to your convenience you know um, we, you see it in all of Jesus' interactions. What is love? Who is your neighbor? You know, if you, if you get to redefine who is your neighbor, well, then you don't have to care about Samaritans because your laws say that they're unclean. Your laws say the Samaritans are no good. They're not your neighbor. Jesus comes and tells a parable to the opposite effect. Like, no, no, no. The Samaritan is your neighbor. Um, what is love? How, what, what do I have to do? What do I have to do to earn eternal life? And the great thing is Jesus says, what does the law say? What is the law? The law is what love (laughs) looks like. How do you know if you're loving God? Well, 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 you jumped ahead. What's the first few commandments? You shall have no other God. Right? You will keep the Sabbath. Keep the Sabbath. Not, take the Lord's name in vain. not take his name in vain. <clears throat> See, it, it, it's not, strictly speaking, is that like, do this and you, mu- you, know, you must do this. Like, no, if you love God, that is what you will do. If you love your neighbor, you won't kill them. <laughs> you won't commit adultery with them. You won't, you know, get them to, you know, these are the ways that love is actually played out. So... Jesus comes and basically, re- and, and he doesn't redefine anything. He says, you guys redefined it. So that's probably where, where we get wrong is, is when we talk about Jesus coming and like, he's turning everything upside down. It's like, no, he's not. He's setting it, yeah, right side up. He's putting it back where it was supposed to be. Everyone took the law and said, Pshaw! and redefined everything. So Jesus is making it right again. All right, so, um, so the, and the whole message that, that Jesus says is Repent. Return. Repentance is returning. Turning back to God. Turning back to his word. Turning away from your definitions. Turning back to God's definitions. Turning away from your word back to God's word. This is what Jesus is doing. So, um, this, is, this is the core message here. The gospel goes out. Repent and believe. Uh, your forgiveness is through God or from God, through Jesus Christ, uh, because he himself is God who saves you from your sin. I mean, that's, that's the message. That's the gospel that... Phew, goes out on Pentecost, and now is, is going out into the world. So, now we're into the period of time post-Pentecost, where the word is going out. And you can basically kind of say that Christianity really starts in these two places. Okay. Um, and, and this is, no, no, you probably thought this definitely, right? Did Antioch jump into mind? Probably not. You know, maybe, but probably not. We, we rarely ever mention Antioch. 
you know, Antioch is the place where the first Christians were called Christians. Um, you know, Acts, Acts 11, 26. You know, that is where they were first called Christians. And this was a derogatory term. It, it's like when Lutherans were first called Lutherans, it wasn't a pleasant thing. <laughs> it was, you know, you Lutheran SOBs kind of thing. Christians, it was the same thing. Um, oh, they made it more difficult and Jesus made it simple again. Yes, correct. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not doing so. See, it's uh, got to get back into the habit of looking at the online stuff too. Sorry. So Antioch is where they're first labeled Christians. Um, now Jerusalem, what, what kind of people do you think are, filled, are, are in Jerusalem? Jews. I'll we'll give you a wild guess what kind of people you find in Antioch. <coughs> a lot of Gentiles, but actually also a lot of, we'll call them displaced Jews. Okay, Antioch is the third largest city in the Roman Empire. Okay, Antioch is a big deal. Um, it's a busy trading hub. It's, on the, it's got a seaport. Uh, there's a mix of cultures. So yes, you have a lot of Gentiles. You also have a lot of displaced Jews. Okay, these were Jews who um, actually they were sent to Antioch by Alexander the Great because they refused to integrate all these Roman pagan stuff into their religion. So Alexander the Great exiles them <laughs> to Antioch. So now you've got basically at this time of the church, got a bunch of Gentiles, but now you have a, a bunch of displaced Jews who, um, who basically were, um, they were, they were Jews who, who, who they lived by the, the Jewish regulations and all that, um, but they weren't, um, they weren't, uh, what do I want to say? They, they, so they were living outside Israel, so they weren't concerned with being like necessarily right there in Jerusalem, but they were outside trying to, to do their best with this. Also with them, you've got Hellenists, Greek-speaking Jews. Um, Greeks who basically, and, and, and Greeks who accepted the God of, of the Jews, um, but didn't accept their ceremonial laws. So you've got this really weird mix of, you know, pagans, displaced Jews, who are already, who already are kind of disconnected from, you know, temple life because they're living outside, right? And then you've got a lot of Hellenized kind of Jews and um, who are kind of a, a mix of like, well, yes, we, we understand that you know, we accept Jewish God and the scriptures, absolutely, but we're not, you know, we're eating bacon. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're eating shrimp, it's cool, and we're not doing all the ceremonial stuff. So here is where you see just an explosion of conversions. Christianity really, this is why Antioch is such a big deal, because people, <laughs> you've got Gentiles, you know, who are hearing the word, and they're like, oh, wow, this, this sounds good, cool. But now you've got Jews who are like, well, they're maintaining the connection to the Old Testament, right? But not the ceremonial stuff. Well, who's coming in and saying like, well, yeah, Jesus fulfilled all that ceremonial stuff. You don't have to. And Jesus is actually linked to the Old Testament. They're like, Sign me up. So this was actually a very fertile ground for them. And it, it provided, it was like, bam. And so you have um, a great place where, um, you know, and so they're, they're feeling like, hey, I don't need to be circumcised, which I would think is a good selling point. Personally speaking, if somebody came up to me and was like, hey, you this, want to be part of this religion? This, and I'm like, that sounds great. And they're like, mm -hmm. um, like eh, we'll see. So, you know, this is, this is just exploding. So at this, Barnabas is sent from Jerusalem to check it out. Like, there's some stuff going on in Antioch. Good things are happening, and they're doing all sorts of crazy stuff. Well, not crazy, but it's like they're, they're you know, they're, they're Christians, and there's Jews, but they're not, they're not forcing anybody to be circumcised. And, and so let, just go and check it out. Make sure it's on, on the up and up. So Barnabas goes and, and goes to check it out. Um, and this is where, you know, so you get into the book of Acts where, in, and, and then Paul goes and, and there's, so they start to kind of integrate everybody together, right? And this is where you also start to see some tensions beginning, okay? So <laughs> right from the get-go you say, wow, Christianity has taken hold and people love it. And what's the, one of the first things that happens? Well, but they should be circumcised. Well, but they shouldn't be circumcised. Oh, man, but they at least need to, they, they at least need to keep kosher. Eh, they don't really need to keep. Right from the get-go, there's, there's 
discussion <laughs> and disagreement over what, what is expected of Jewish converts uh, or a uh, Gentile converts, either, either one. Do the, um, do, they have to, do the Jews have to keep all that stuff from the Old Covenant? Do the Gentiles need to add it in? So there was an agreement. If you go into the book of Acts, you find out that when they, they all got together and discussed it, and they decided that, um, all right, so Gentiles, they need to observe the Sabbath. No needs for circumcision. Um, actually, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They don't need to observe the Sabbath in terms of like the Jewish Sabbath. They don't need to do that. They don't need circumcision. Um, they're not supposed to eat strangled meat that's been strangled. Okay. And, um, you know, food laws are not demanded. Okay. But they shouldn't eat food sacrificed to idols. No food sacrificed to idols. Um, and no adultery, <laughs> which should go without saying. <laughs> but that was kind of the, the compromise. Okay. Now, right from the get-go, you look at that and like, but doesn't Paul talk about food sacrificed to idols and it's really not a big deal? It's like, well, yeah. But from the get-go, we're not, what they're looking at is how can we bring all, the, all these things into unity? Okay, they're, they're not so much concerned about let's nail out this doctrine and get everybody on the same page. It's like Christ is doing his work, the Holy Spirit is doing his work. How are we going to be able to agree to disagree in unity? You know, so the Jewish converts, you know, does it, does it hurt them to keep kosher and to be circumcised? Nah. Do the Gentiles need to be? Nah. But there's very strong opinions. So you need to find that consensus. So they weren't, they weren't interested in like hammering out like this is the law of the land. It was like, well, what does Paul say? He says this is the law of love. Our love for our neighbor. That's what we should be seeking. Not make sure you agree to every little detail, but make sure we're agreeing in love and letting love cover a multitude of all sins, right? Which is John, not Paul. Anyway, so um, there we go. Um, James, the brother of Jesus, head of the uh, Jerusalem church, he did not insist on full acceptance of Jewish traditions, um, but he said we should avoid any break between the church and the ancient people of God. So he was kind of along with Paul saying like the law of love needs to be observed. Like we, we don't need to force anybody to hold this, but at the same time we can't allow a break in the church to say have, look, have anybody look at the other side with disdain, which is always the issue. Oh, I'm better than you because I keep kosher. Well, I'm better than you because I'm not circumcised and I don't need to be. And I'm blah, blah. So it's all about trying to get, get them together in love. So that's, that's the early church. I got a question. Who was, who was teaching in these churches at the time? Because sooner or later, all the disciples were killed. Yeah. Um, well, the apostles, you know, it, it starts with the apostles. So they go out and they bring in, you know, like with Paul and Timothy. So they bring up people. And they, so these, like Timothy, followed Paul, was with Paul. Paul <coughs> taught him, um, you know, put him in a position to be like, okay, now you're, you're overseeing this church. So it was just kind of a, a grassroots sort of ra raising up people. And um, there were, you know, so there'd be, after the apostles, so like a person like Timothy could be visiting churches, you know, or stationed at one kind of area and then maybe visit other areas. But it was, it was very much just them kind of raising people up. <clears throat> all right, so... While this is all going on, so now we're going to be in about 65 to 70. While this happens, there's also a period of time where um, the Jews start kind of active rebellion against Rome. Uh, there, there's a period of time where um, there's a, the Roman governor died, and before a new one was put in, um, the, <laughs> the Sanhedrin of the Jews took over in Judea. And so basically they took over and like, all right, now, now we're... we're doing our own thing now, we're, we're, we're free from, from Rome. Um, and part of what they did was basically started taking out a lot of their aggression and frustrations on the Christians. Um, they accused James, brother of Jesus, of blasphemy because he wouldn't denounce Christ. And so in response to that, when he said he, he would not recant, they threw him off a cliff and then stoned him to death. Which, you know, one or the other, but no, you do both. 
brother of Jesus. Brother of Jesus. I thought he was killed for his story. Um, I'm pretty sure it was James, the brother of Jesus. I'll double check. Okay. I could be wrong. Somebody check. Somebody online check for me. <laughs> Which James was thrown on the cliff and, and stoned? It could have been. I don't, I don't know for sure. I'll check. Which one? All right. So, things turn really bad for the Christians, and they see what's going on. Jews are rebelling against Rome. Jews are taking it out on Christians. So they actually begin to say, like, hey, maybe we should leave Jerusalem. <laughs> we need to get out of town. Things aren't looking good. So before 70 AD, which is when Rome comes in and destroys the temple and, you know, raises Jerusalem, the Christians have already, by and large, left, um, which you know, is also where some hostility or, or um, not hostility, what do I want to say, um, resentment comes in with, like, Jewish-Christian relations. Like, you know, the Christians got out and they, they you know, they escaped, whereas the Jews, main, you know, received the brunt. So it's kind of like looking at it like, oh, the, the Christians pulled back so the Rome, Romans could come in and demolish. So there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on that still even today has some residual effects. So the Christian communities move east. Uh, well, I mean, they move, move all over, but there are some that move to the east. And, um, and right from the get-go, so, okay, 70 AD, right? There, there's a subset of Christians who, who move out to the east, past the Jordan, I think. And they remain there pretty much isolated from anybody else, isolated from the greater church until the 5th century. So until, you know, for 400 years almost, they're isolated from everybody else. Well, what do you think happens there is that they develop a form of Christianity that um, preserves their Jewish rituals, you know, circumcision, um, keeping the Sabbath, all those things that they're like, eh, we don't need to worry about it. So they bring that back. Um, they also start saying like, you know what? Jesus wasn't born in a natural way. He, was, he, resi- he received divine power in his baptism. This is a heresy that comes out later. Um, and uh, so they... <laughs> They, they, you, you see right from the get-go, a, a group that kind of detaches itself from the greater church almost immediately falls into heresy. <laughs> so you can see, you know, there, there's issues and there's problems. All right, so moving from there, so you've got, um, you've got the early church now that is starting to spread out. And it kind of spreads out and, and focuses in a few major areas. Um, I think Carthage and Lyon. Okay, so you got Rome, you know, you know where Rome is. Egypt, so kind of the church in the Middle East and the gateway to there. Uh, Carthage is kind of the church gateway to Africa. Lyon, the church gateway to Europe. So you, you kind of see where, where the church is really starting to spread out, okay, from Jerusalem and then Rome or Jerusalem and, and Antioch. Now it's like it's expanding rapidly. Um, Rome is kind of you know we, we focus in on Rome, especially our, our Catholic friends. You know the Roman Catholic Church, the Holy Roman Empire, whatever. The fun thing about that is that um, Rome, in the early church, was not special, really. There was kind of a tradition that recognized Rome as not necessarily special, but distinct in that it was the place where Peter and Paul died. It was where they served and, and, and where they died, most what it was agreed to. Um, that Rome did suffer first under persecution, uh, first by Nero and then Domitian. So Rome was first to be persecuted and kind of by Rome in, in, in its kind of ferocity. And then... Um, there was uh, Rome, the, the Roman churches did have a, a reputation for charity, hospitality. They were kind of, that's what they were known for. Other than that, there wasn't anything special about Rome. The whole idea that Rome was special, that the bishop of Rome was the supreme, basically, you know, Peter and the Pope and all the stuff that comes in, that is much later. Okay, that is not an early th- part of the church. I don't care what, our, you know, I love my Catholic friends, but they're wrong. Um, and it's not just me because I'm a, I'm a, Cranky Lutheran, it's historical. <laughs> there is just no reference to this. In fact, um, we have references where um, there, there was a bishop in Rome at one point who, 
who claimed that he had authority over tradition that nobody else had. And basically, anybody who disagreed with him concerning the, the date of Easter, he excommunicated. Um, and all, most of the church, everybody in the church basically rebuked him for it and told him, that, like, no, you're wrong. Get out. <laughs> so there, there's no, Rome wasn't that big of a deal. Um, but, you know, this is where we usually kind of focus all of our attention. Egypt is interesting. Um, and we don't know, we don't have a lot of detailed history on how these churches kind of started. Okay? We have a, a few stories here and there, but like the actual foundation of these churches, we don't know. Okay? However, um, tradition suggests Mark or Barnabas founded the, the Egyptian church, Alexandria, all that. Um, the, the indications that we have, are the historical record, seems to suggest that um, what the church was doing in Egypt was trying to find a philosophical basis for combining various religious traditions. That was kind of the, the way Egypt's kind of vibe was. That was what was going on. So you plant a church there, a church body, in the context of, oh, we're trying to blend all these religions together. And you see where this might be an, a bad influence. So that's where the, the Egyptian church kind of starts to come into fruition. Um, you know, it was, actually the, the fun thing is the Septuagint, the Greek version of the New, New Testament, was commissioned by an Egyptian king, Ptolemy. Um, the purpose behind it was to better integrate Jewish belief into Egyptian belief. Like, if we take their book and translate it into a language we know, we can better integrate all of their stuff into ours. So, you know, Egypt's history there is like, yes, let's, let's just take it all and make it all one. And here's the Christian church, which is like, no. And yet it's going to push back a lot. Did you have your... your I, I just kept on going there. Was, uh, is that where the Coptic... The Coptic? Yes. The Egyptian Christians? Christians? Yes. Ooh, okay. Matt Meyer Huber for the win. He says, James, the son of Zebedee, put to death by the sword by Herod and Acts. James, brother of Jesus, by stoning according to tradition. So, yes, G uh, James, brother of Jesus, cliffs uh, and stoned. Um, James, brother of John, son of Zebedee, uh, put to death with the sword. And there we go. James, the, the brother of Jesus, was the elder yes. of the church council. Yes. In yes. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. See, I think, and, and I think Matt is, is, Matt's the big history guy, too. I'm pretty sure. So he's going to be loving this. Um, all right. So also in Egypt, you get this uh, Valentinus guy who um, started to integrate Gnostic ideas into the church. Um, so Gnosticism is going to be a thing that creeps in, is still an issue today. Um, we're going to talk about this more, but Gnosticism is essentially this idea that there is a secret wisdom that only God can reveal to you. Basically, Gnosticism says everything physical, everything natural is evil. So this stuff is bad. The physical body, the physical, everything in creation is evil. If you want to be saved, you must transcend and find a secret spiritual wisdom that only God gives to certain people. That's the heart of Gnosticism. It's wrong, it's bad. It's, it, it, honestly, it's actually behind, um, in a way, like the idea like, oh, you know, the ultimate goal for us is we die and we become angels. That has its roots here. It sounds occultic. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, but that's the idea, is that somehow, because our goal is not human to be humans, because humanity is bad, flesh is bad. We want to become angels. We want to be these spiritual beings. It's like, no, no, no. We want to be resurrected human beings, like God made us. So Gnosticism is going to be a big deal. You know, it didn't start in Egypt by any measure, but we see it creeping in there. Um, <laughs> also part of Valentinus' thing was, hey, you know, there's only one God, right? But we don't know his name. He goes by many names. So that way, when you have a religion that has lots of gods... What he can say is like, oh, don't worry, you're compatible with us. Because all those names that you have for your gods, there's just different names for the same one. And we're all can, we can all kumbaya together. Or that, that 
you got Rome, Egypt, and Carthage in line there. Is a Christian church is different from each one? It is yes and no. So, um, okay, this is, this is good because I've got so much stuff and we're only on page five here. Um, so basically what happens is, um, let me see. Okay. Um, every Christian congregation, however it met, and they were meeting primarily in houses initially, um, they were all autonomous. There was no overarching kind of organizational unit. Now, they were all together. You know, they all agreed, and, and so bishops would get together and, and, and have councils and conferences and whatnot. But they were basically kind of all separate little entities um, held together by apostolic teaching. But they, they, they had differences based on where they were. So the cu- surrounding culture, that flavored what they did, how they did it. Um, their worship was similar, but it, it varied. There was a lot of, the, uh, initially there was a lot of differences. Not crucial differences, just like, hey, we, you know, when we, when we worship, we like to sit down at the beginning. And it's like, oh, well, over here we like to stand up because everybody's used to that. It's like, oh, okay, cool, awesome. Um, over time, what happens is the trend starts to go towards unifying and having more, um, everybody doing more uniformity in, in what they're doing, which is, I mean, I mean, that's a scientific thing, right? Everything kind of gravitates towards some kind of order. Or is that, no? I don't know. This is why I didn't get into science. Yeah. Opposite. opposite, well. <laughs> okay, well, may, maybe not science. Okay, what we see in, in human interactions is we, we, we tend to band together and like, let's, 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 more order and less chaos. So. What are your descriptions? Uh, you remind me of. Well, that's true. Not about uh, 20 or 30 years ago, I was in Belize. Okay. And, uh, the schools were not government schools. The schools were Baptist, Methodist, right. uh, Episcopalian. You know, and I, how are these kids getting educated? How are, how are they? Uh, it, it left me with a lot of questions in my mind. Oh, I'm sure. And they said they were all Christian churches, but they were all different. Right. So, so in, a, in a developing country, it's difficult. Oh, yeah. And actually, speaking of education, so in, in Egypt, in Alexandria, um, there was a, uh, a, Jew, uh, a Christian convert who started up a, a Christian school. And basically it was to, the idea was to instruct anybody, young or old, uh, educated, uneducated, whoever, but to instruct people in the gospel, to teach them go- the gospel. Now attached to that was a, um, they included courses that instructed them, instructed anybody on basic grammar, all the way to Christian philosophy, astronomy, medicine, whatever. It was kind of like, you know, like a liberal arts school attached to it, right? That was open to anybody. Any pagan could come. Whether or not they want to be a Christian or not, they could come and take part in this. Um, The idea was true philosophy, true education, true scientific, well, I guess it wouldn't be scientific discovery at that point, but what they would consider, you know, discovery, would would always lead to Christian faith. So that way it was like, if we teach the right things, even if a pagan comes and like, I'm not interested in Christianity, by teaching them correctly, it will guide them to, to Christianity which I, <laughs> I keep hammering on the science thing that I know nothing about. Um, but I'll say anecdotally, the, the scientists who I've talked to, it's like they say the more I research, the more I dig deeper into things, the more I might be drawing closer to the idea that there is a God and that kind of thing. So that, that was kind of the understanding of the school. Um, so that, that began, I mean, we're talking, yeah, first, second century, early, early, early. Um, so uh, Carthage, we don't, really know much about the foundation of that church. Um, Leon, same thing. Um, it seemed to be established very early on. So the point is Christianity is exploding, geographically and numerically, like with people. Where is the city today of Leon? Where would that be located in modern-day Europe? France, uh, uh, southern France, I think. What's your question? Where is Leon now? Uh, uh, somewhere in France. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. Th- this would be um, Tunisia. Tunisia. Yeah, Tunisia. Sorry, Tunisia. Sorry. Sounds more fancy that way. <laughs> Egypt's in Egypt. <laughs> North Africa. Yes. Yeah. Do we know who took Christianity to Leon? Nope. I mean, there, there. We don't know for sure. There's, there's tradition. There's stories. 
but we don't know. But we, we have, um, by the middle of third century, so, you know, that's what, 250s, middle of the third century? So by the end of our little time period here, we have stories, again, stories, not hard evidence, but there are stories about Christians in uh, Europe, Armenia, India, China. Um, so, I mean, in 250 years, it has basically reached the ends of the known world. So it has just gone all over the place. How did they... Uh come about the Bible? How did they, were they teach the Bible, or did they all have a little, like they're doing now, taking this out? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's not an easy answer. <laughs> um, well, I mean, yes. basically, and we, we covered this a little bit in one of the studies before that, before, before we broke for um, Lent, is that um, uh, early on, like by the middle of the second century, really, uh, most of the churches really were in agreement with what books constituted the New Testament. There was, a, there was disagreements, there's always disagreements, but by and large there was broad agreement. And then by the end of this time period, 250, everyone's pretty much on the same page. Um, the fun thing is that Gnosticism played a big part in that. Because Gnosticism, so the idea was, how did this work? Um, so, Okay, so Gnostics would say that there was a secret tradition passed down from Peter and Paul. Secret words of Christ, incantations, whatever. Secret that was only passed down from Peter and Paul. Only they knew about it. They, could, they were the only ones who could establish this tradition. And no one else has ever heard about it. Therefore, it must be true. That's the way they thought. Don't ask me. But, but that, because they were doing that, and they would say, we have the secret knowledge, that forced the early church to be more, more out there about, <coughs> these are the only authoritative writings. Don't listen to these idiots. These writings are the good ones. The word agnostic comes from this? Um, well, uh, yeah, it would be, so Gnosticism is um, like knowledge, like a, a secret knowledge, a, a knowing of things. So agnostic would mean that you, yeah. you, you don't have a knowledge. It's like you're not, you're not confirming or denying. You're just, there, there's, there's no knowledge either way about it. They were actually doing a favor then. The, <laughs> because, because they were forcing the other... In, in a way of looking at it, it, yes. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, they were forcing them to... I, okay, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they did them a favor. I'd say there was a, well, there was a happy result of it <laughs> because they've been their influence has been a problem and still is today in, in Wolf Mueller's book he talks about mysticism and enthusiasm yep are those in the American Christian church right are those oh that was all back then too coming from Nas, the early it, it came from them yeah absolutely um, there was a whole um, well, along with you know, the Gnostics who said, yeah, we have secret knowledge, um, there was another subset of that, which basically said, part of theirs was like, yes, we accept the scriptures, but we also are getting current revelation from God. So we're getting God speaking to us now currently, and whatever, it's basically what evangelicals say now. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it was way back then. So yeah, nothing like all the, the silliness that goes on in the, in the church today, where you're like, what are these idiots up to? It was right, it was in there from the get-go. You get -go. said that is still a problem today. I mean, what, explain that. What do you mean? Oh, just um, secret knowledge that, you know, it, the idea behind this is, okay, God's word says, like, written in, in, the, in the Bible, it says this. Jesus said exactly this, which is what we say, yeah. The Gnostic looks at that and says, that's not what he meant. So there are certain churches now that Oh, absolutely. Oh, good Lord, yes. Everybody does, to a degree. Um, well, not everybody, but I mean a lot of churches do. So a Gnostic would look at this and say, he, didn't, he might have said this, but it's not what he meant. Well, to really know. understand what he meant, you have to get behind the text. You have to get to the spiritual meaning of the text. And it's not that. In fact, that was just to throw some people off. The real meaning is what God is telling me right now, or the real meaning is what this crazy person told me. Um, 
Oh yeah, this is big time. This is absolutely, yeah. That practice, I mean, honestly, it's not just a formal response. It is a confession. It is us saying, "This is what God said. This is what we're teaching." Do you so what, know particularly what churches are? <laughs> a lot of them. Don't want to know. Yeah. It, it, well, it, it's not just one. It's not a single church body. You could have you could have a Lutheran church. You could have an LCMS church that does this. It, it's, it infects a lot of stuff. This is why you always have to be discerning about this stuff. Right. Oh, oh, sure, like anybody who says, well, the Bible has God's word in it, but not all of it. Like, we don't like what Paul, you know, a lot of church bodies, very, you know, oh, I, I see you, buddy. Um, a lot of um, church bodies will say, well, we don't follow Paul, we follow Jesus. So anything Paul says goes right out. There's a lot of books thrown out, right? Gnostic books, yes. Yeah. But not not the so, not the, the, the apostolic well, writings, well, yes. What I was saying was that, <laughs> that Gnostic forced the rest of them to conform, you know, together and say there's only sixty six Bibles no, chapters. It, well, it, 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 it was a mess. It was a mess. They did. Yeah. Okay, the, que- the question is, can we, by 250 AD, say that the canon was established? I, yeah. I mean, th- there wasn't like, you know, like, everybody says the Council of Nicaea established the canon. That's not true. The canon was established. Nicaea might have said, like, We're, we agree, right? We agree it's established, right? Cool. They might have formalized it in some sense, but it wasn't like establishing it. Uh, Matt has a comment here, which is awesome said, my roommate's girlfriend in college broke up with him and said God told her to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I mean, but I mean, that's kind of the example. Like, oh, God told me. Oh, I'm getting a message here. Oh, he told me to do this. And see, that's the problem when you start. I mean, that, as funny and kind of as frivolous as that might be, is a decent example of what Gnosticism would be. It does lend weight. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, was it Sunday that I ta- said something about that? Um, like the biggest thing that I encountered in, um, in Oklahoma where you have a lot of Pentecostal sort of God has given me a new word is somebody would say, and this is how it works, and I could, I could do this. I'm not going to. Stand up there and say, God has told me. He's given me a word. And he tell, told me that he wants each one of you to put $100 in the offering basket today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, but I mean, that was... that. <laughs> That kind of stuff would, would get played there because like, oh, well, well, God's representative is talking. My response always to that was always, well, what if God told me not to? Like, oh, he told you that? Oh, wait, whoa, whoa, I'm getting something. Oh, no, he told me. Oh, he's just telling me I don't have to. Because who's right? And in that case, they say, well, I'm the pastor. Well, I'm, I'm the prophet in this. I'm the representative. It's like, priesthood of all believers. Bam. Um... But yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's foolishness. Um, but that's, so when that's that. Oh, that's much later. Okay. That's much later. Oh, yeah, that's much later. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't get ahead. Um, oh, gosh. We're, so we're halfway through what I prepared for tonight. Um, remember when I said like three or four sessions? Eh. But anyway. Um, the interesting thing, and, and this might be the, the thing we, we end off with today, is so you've got Christianity in the, in the first 100 years, 200 years, exploding. Okay. It was done, all this growth was done by ordinary Christians. There was no seminary. There were no mission, we have no records of any special missionary societies. You know, kind of like how in, you know, we have different missionary societies in the Lutheran church, in the Catholic church, whatever. Every church body has like their missionary arm. None of that. Didn't exist back then. Um, There was uh, no organized effort. We have no record of of the churches saying that we need to go out there and get more people. But what about Paul's missionary journey? That was initially, but I mean that was like, that was in this kind of, once the age of the apostles, like the apostles die off, 
So once you get past that 70 AD and like 100 AD, that, that spread, that rapid spread was ordinary Christians. Now you might, yeah, you would have, you might have like missionaries like Paul who would establish churches, but we're talking about the growth was all ordinary. It was all people. Um, and it's funny is that we don't have really any named missionaries until you're talking about like St. Patrick centuries later. Um, Patrick who goes to Ireland. You've got Angsgar who goes to Scandinavia. You've got Gregory um, who did a lot of stuff. We don't have that many like, there's not a lot of missionaries that we know early on. Hardly any. Um, So basically what happened is most of the growth is from pagans seeing these Christians living differently. Like actually like visibly different like what is going on now next time if we're still talking about this there was a a, a part of that had to do with the the religious um context you know back then it was not there was no there was no secular society it was all polytheistic it was a very religious time in the world christianity and you know Judaism, obviously, also, but Christianity is, is, is exploding by being very monotheistic, one God. Okay, this is, it's, it's going against the grain here. Now, sneak preview, a lot of the problems that we start to get with heresies and whatnot is because you've got a polytheistic society. Well, you've got Jewish society, which we don't, you know, they don't like us Christians because we're, you know, blaspheming. Then you've got a polytheistic society that says, there's many gods. Here comes the Christians. And we say, no, Yahweh, the God of the Jews, he's, he's the one God. And they're like, okay, we've heard this story. And, like, and Jesus is his son. And he's one God. And they're like, hmm, math don't add up. So now you've got the Jews who are freaking out because we're blaspheming them. And you've got the polytheists saying, oh, you're just like us. So the Christian church has to be like, how do we explain this? How do we explain to you people that we're not polytheistic? And especially the Jews who are telling everybody, they're just polytheists. And we're like, no, we're not. But how do we explain this? And once we go down that road is where things go, <laughs> we're going to talk about a lot of heresies that flow from this. This is where we get creeds and whatnot, yeah. And the Athanasian creed is a big one. But so that's where a lot of things go, go squirrely. But, um, the, but the point is, is that Christians lived differently. I mean, it was like, you guys are different. Which, and, and maybe this would be a good way to end it, is kind of why, you know, why I take, you know, if you notice in our, our Sunday morning class, um, and I get a little bit of pushback on this, but I'm sticking to my guns, I don't care. Um, again, this, this is my approach to things. Take it with whatever grain of salt you want. <clears throat> like this, this last Sunday, I don't want, I'm not going to try to frame it or like accuse anybody of anything, but we brought up the, the Acts reading, how it was like, and everybody was in, was in unity, and everybody sold all their property and pooled the money and provided for everyone. And I was pointing out how it's like, you know, we look at that and we say, well, that's not, that's not prescriptive, that's just describing. And it's like, true, but what it is describing is what fidelity to God's word actually leads you to. If we were to be serious and honest about what, what God's word says, we would be more willing and likely to do that kind of thing. Okay? Now, what was fun was on Sunday, we got some pushback from that. Like, well, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it was a different place, and, and we, we don't know exactly, it doesn't say how it was done, and, 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 and it was like, well, no, no, it, it wasn't understood to be that. And, and there was a little bit of pushback, which I fully I understand. But see, my point of view is, I, 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 don't, I don't go with that. See, I, I always say, like, you know what? And, and I get a lot of push, like, we're, we're expected to keep the law. You know, we're supposed to live according to God's word. Not, not keep the law for our salvation, but, I mean, being born again in the gospel, we're supposed to live according to the law. It's just what, how God wants us to live. Now, can we do that perfectly to the degree that we should? No. That's not an excuse. 
That's never an excuse. Just because we are sinful people and can't do the law is not an excuse for us not to do it. It's a reason we can't do it, but it's not an excuse. And those are two very different things. It's not a good reason either, but it's a reason. So it doesn't, just because we're sinful and we can't do it perfectly does not remove the, the expectation that we would do this. So in my frame of mind, when I look at a text that says we should be radically living different and like even this crazy communist kind of idea of, of sharing everything, you know, and, you know, pure communism, we're talking about, you know, sharing and living and commune with people, is that we, we pool all of our resources and we take care of one another. I would say that is what we probably should do. Okay. I think that is the natural extension of what the gospel says and what the law drives us to. Now, we don't want to. I don't want to. That's my sinful self. Because I don't trust that somebody's going to take care of me. <laughs> I can barely take care of myself. So um, doing that, are we sinners? Oh, well, we're sinners regardless. See, that's the thing. And, and so I don't, I don't look at that and like I, I say, well, you know, should we be striving towards that? I would say, yeah. And especially when you, when you take a look at the actual historical evidence here of how the church exploded, it exploded because they saw them actually living differently. Now, does the world, do, do the unbelievers outside of these walls, do they see us living fundamentally, drastically differently? See, now, when I grew up and I went to church, I was always told something to the effect of, you know, that's why you come to church, so your neighbor sees that your car isn't there on Sunday morning. That is your testimony to them. I'm like, what? No, that just means I went to IHOP. <laughs> what does that mean? But I mean, that... that I love everybody who, who raised me, <laughs> and I'm, 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 saying, I'm not saying this was my mom. This was the, the pastors. You know, this is what I heard. Um, and that was like, that's your testimony. It's like, no, it's not. That's not, you know, true love is giving your life for another. You know, willing to sacrifice. It's like, I think honest, if we were really serious about this, if we really wanted to live a life that was so different that it would cause the pagans to take notice, we would be having to do a lot more than we are. My children never went out on Sunday, Pastor, when they were growing up. <gasps> we, we went to church, and it, we did chores because we had to take care of the animals. Right, right. But other than that, we did not go out. <gasps> Sinner. <laughs> but I mean, that, it's like, oh, that's your testimony? It's like, well, no. It's just... Everybody knew, though. Right, right, right. <laughs> Oh, oh, okay, we have a couple comments I'm catching up here. Um, oh, yeah, so Matt says, which helps spread the gospel faster. I'm assuming he's saying the, the living a life. Um, we have, uh, oh, Joel jumps in here. Don't forget Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, Justin Martyr, Tertullian, Origen, Cyprian of Carthage, Eusebius, Athanasius, they live from 75, 300. Absolutely, yes. Those are a lot of the big hitters, church fathers. Um, I didn't get far into them because... That was going to take us down a whole another. <laughs> that was going to get us a lot deeper. We can go there if you want. But um, yes, um, Joel, you are absolutely 100%. Yeah, there's a lot about them that is crucial. And some interesting things, we'll actually talk about some of their beliefs where you're going to go like, wait, what? But we're going to explain why. But anyway. Um, my mom says, hippie sounds much better than communist. Yes, <laughs> true. <laughs> Um, yes, and Joel says the early church members still own their homes um, and have their jobs to make money, which, I mean, there, there's, that's why the, the, the argument in Bible study was like, well, the, you know, they, they, we don't have the exact, you know, it doesn't say that they, they sold everything, you know, assuming they still had to live somewhere and they had to whatever. Um, and that's why I say the, it's not a prescription, but it, it leads us in that direction. So, um, I mean, honestly, should you, should we as a congregation sell all of our homes and all of our cars and all of our property and pull it all together and, and, you know, live in a commune where we're just sharing, you know, yeah, we'd still be working, but all the money would go into the pot. Um, if you wanted to, we could give it a shot. Um, where do we start? What? That's what the Amish do. Well, yeah. Um, but I mean, okay, which is a great point. We look at the Amish and say, whoa, what's up with them? Why? Because they live drastically differently. 
they're very firm in their belief and say this is the now we disagree <laughs> with you know doctrine and whatever but um you know to a point it's like well their their way of life is is it, it draws the attention um and you know i don't um you know so i don't and honestly where, where i kind of go with the, the history of the early church is what we see is that a lot of these churches they they did look different and they did things differently not heretically, but differently, because of where they were and what they're dealing with. So yeah, would, would right now where we live in our country with our laws and our whatever and, and tax implications and yada, 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 would it work for us all to get together and sell everything and become Lutheran Amish people? It's like, eh, the logistics are probably pretty rough. <laughs> probably wouldn't work out too well. Um, it might be a tough sell. But I think there are a lot of things that we could do and live differently in some ways, markedly differently, that would be visible from the outside where people would say, wait a second, they're different. And honestly, I don't think people, by and large, look at, well, I'm, I'm going to get off on a rant. Um, uh, if, you look at, if you look at the comments on YouTube, um, uh, Joel has been uh, chiming in on our, our morning prayers, and he's been bringing in a lot of good um, a lot of good insight on stuff. So thank you, Joel. And he's hopped on tonight. Um, he says the goal was to take care of your family, then your church family, and then outside the church. And absolutely. Um, but it's just like, how do you do that in such a drastic sense? Um, the fun thing is that, so the early church, it was like, how do we live so drastically different from the culture? Okay. Well, for the past 20, 30, 40 years, what has by and large, and I'll say the Western American church, what has that church tried to present itself as? it looks very much like the culture. Like, you don't have to change your life to come here. We accept everything. You don't have to change. We're, you know, hey, we're, we're, all, we're all good. And if I'm, I don't have anything against different instrumentation, but, you know, the styles of worship, if it starts to emulate kind of like, oh, no, it's, you know, this is what we're trying to get, so make it easier for people to come here. Uh, again, why would... It, it, it's easy to come here to live now a drastically different life, sacrificing for the other and dying to sin. This is not an easy sell. I don't think you should make it one. Um, so I've got... Uh, <laughs> Joel says, give me the money, I'll take care of it. <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> but, well, I, okay, nothing against you, Joel. But I mean, that's a problem. Somebody would be like, oh, let me do it. Do you trust that person? No, that's my money. <laughs> that's the thing we don't trust. And but but again, getting aside from or away from that, um, a lot of the early church really blossomed because it was so different. Roman culture, you know, humility that was a sign of weakness. No one was humble. Pride that was if you were a man, you were prideful. Um, if you um, you know, uh, people, you know, were, were things and, and whatever. You didn't care, caring about the needy? No, no. If you were like a, a philosophical heavyweight, it was like, no, you care about yourself first and foremost of, of all things. Christianity is the polar opposite of that. So in that, in that time, that drastic living, I mean, it completely opposite the culture. Now, it's like, so what does it look like for us? Well, you know, we, we'd have to be pretty bold, you know, to stand up for the things that we preach, teach, and confess. And it's hard because, you know, we, we have this ingrown sort of like, well, we want to have a hearing. We want you to like us so you will listen to us. And we're going to say some pretty hard things that you're going to disagree with. And uh, we don't like that kind of conflict. And it's like, eh, we're going to have to have hard conversations. The Lutheran teaching on suffering, Lutheran and Catholic too, on suffering is very, very different from the Pentecostal. Oh, yeah. On suffering. Yes. Yeah, I mean, suffering, you know, you, you turn on any televangelist, the whole goal of the gospel is to alleviate all your suffering. If you're faithful enough, you will not suffer. Meanwhile, Paul's like, no, we are crucified with Christ. We're brought into suffering. You're talking about um, that passage in Acts leading us towards that kind of a lifestyle. But that thinking seems to ignore the, our sinfulness. 
And that's why we don't trust Joel with the money. <laughs> <laughs> Again, no offense, Joel. <laughs> Okay, maybe I, I shouldn't say that that passage leads us to it. I'd probably should say the gospel leads us to that. Um, well, no, that's absolutely the problem, is our sinful flesh does resist that. But I think um, here, here's where, where my distinction is. Because our sinful flesh rejects that, means that we shouldn't look at that and say, oh, we don't, no, no, no. It's not, that's definitely not prescriptive at all. See, my, my look at that text is like, it's not specifically prescri- prescriptive, but it, it kind of leads you in that way where it's like, why? Okay. I think my point on Sunday was, it's not, look at what they're doing, do this. It's, look at what they're doing, why are they doing it? Mm-hmm. And that's what should guide us. So that's why, you know, I look at the, so I would look at the Acts text um, and say, should we emulate exactly what is described there? I would say no. Not exactly what's described there. Should the spirit of what they're doing be what guides us? And I would say, absolutely. We should, you know, <laughs> well, oh gosh, this is, this is going to devolve into a whole thing. Um, <laughs> Matt says, small o orthodox Christianity is hard. You are absolutely correct. Um, we don't give out money. Oh. <laughs> that was well timed. Um, you know, like, we, we don't have a fund, well, it's not that we don't give out money, we don't have a fund. So if somebody comes and like, I need help paying my bills, we don't have a fund for that. A lot of churches don't. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> That's his banker. Yeah. <laughs> my son, they give up. Where, where I came from, I don't know. Came from, right. people would do acts of charity, but they would do it silently. My dad always said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Yeah, so yeah. Generous acts yeah, yeah. For, for one, for other Christians. Sure, sure. But you, you do it anonymously. Yeah. And it was that spirit of yeah. loving the other that was right. behind it. Yeah. yeah. That should be the driving thing behind the whole thing. Um, but it's, it's, we don't have, yeah. our sinful flesh always gets in the way. You know, why don't you give a five to the, the homeless guy on the side of the road when you're going home tonight? Because, well, I don't want him to, you know, I want him to use this money for food, not, you know, this, that, or the other. I'm not telling you what you should do. <laughs> but, I mean, what, what, what I'm saying is, what, 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 what is the process there? What are you thinking? Is it like, well, I'm, I don't want to, you know, this could help, but I don't want to help it, don't, I don't want it to, you know, do something that I don't want it to do. It's like, well... Okay, if that's the case, then why don't you pull over and ask them if they're hungry and then go buy them something? Well, now you've got, well, I don't have time. It's like, ooh, okay. I mean, that, that, there's a lot of, and that's just like very small example of that. Like I said, we don't have a fund for handing out money to people. Well, is it abused at churches? Absolutely. I heard a guy tonight. <laughs> Did we care? I heard a black guy talking. He's on television quite a bit. He said, the welfare system is dragging the black community down. Okay. Because they're relying on the government for a handout. Now, I've heard them that they're really mad because the money that should be given to them, they think, is going to the people that are walking across the river. Okay. Immigrants. Well, see, and, but that's, that gets in a whole another thing where, again, it's like you've, you've got your political realm. You've got that. I mean, Scripture is full of just, hey, give money. Help people. Love the sojourner. Um, like I said, this is where our, our Christian faith, our doctrine, the, the gospel and the law, would lead us into a life that is very different than what we're doing. And we think we're doing a pretty good job. I would say, you know, any given day, I'm like, well, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. Honestly, that's a lie. If I'm being perfectly honest with myself, I'm not doing the best I can. I'm doing the best I can comfortably to my comfort level. And sometimes not even that. <laughs> um, but that, that's that fight with sin. That's, and it's a, tr- it's a tough barrier. I mean, if I was, you know, like... 
if, if I've got $20, $20 left for the week and I don't have dinner for the family for Friday yet, and I know I'm getting paid on Monday, I've got $20, and I'm going to drive by and there's a dude who says, you know, $20 so I can put up, you know, take my family to a hotel tonight so we're not out in the cold. And I'm like, ooh, that's a tough one. You know? Now, if I was to live... You know, I'm, again, I'm not saying what, what is right or wrong, and you could always say, well, if you give it to him, you're not providing for your family. Um, but I could also then say, well, if I give it to him, maybe I'm trusting in God to provide. I've got a great church family. And honestly, and it wouldn't be a fact where I'm like, well, I'm just going to wait to see if somebody notices. If I did that, I would probably call one of you and say, hey, can we join you for dinner tonight? <laughs> what if I did that? What would you say? There's plenty of food. Take them home. Okay, I'm calling Carrie first, obviously. But I mean, that, that's the thing. It's like, do you, would you think, do we normally think about that? No, because I don't want to impose on you. See, there's, there's a whole, there's a, the, and it, it, I'm, I'm presenting it very simplistically. I mean, there's a lot of calculus and whatever and a lot of steps to this. But I mean, there's so much that's already built in. Like, I don't want to, I don't want you to, I don't want to present myself as I can't provide for my family. And I don't want to be an imposition on any of you. But if I was really you know, trusting in God to provide, I'd say, you know what? God has provided me a church family who, who loves my family. But don't you want us to think about our church family that way? Well, yeah. Okay. I know, right? So. And if I don't do that, I'm not practicing what I preach, right? And therein lies the issue is that we all have this like, ugh, and it's, it's partially, you know, it's pride, it's, it's rugged American individualism, I can do it all myself. There's so many factors to this that this is all fighting against that impulse. And there's a lot to it. And like I said, there's, there's so many, we can go on and on and on. And the, the issue that I have in the, going back to closing this off 20 minutes after we should have stopped class anyway, um, would be going back to Sunday is I don't like to immediately stop at like, but wait, you know, it's not saying that we should do this because we have to take care of this first. I, I don't want to always jump to that. I always want to stop and think about it, like why? You know, oh, well, we should be giving more. Well, no, 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 we're, we're giving enough. It's like, well, why shouldn't we give more? We should be caring for people more. We should be willing to trust in God more. Like, okay, let's consider that. Um, you know, when, when um, uh, or just like, I, I don't, like, I don't like when Jesus, well, I like it when Jesus says this. Um, you know, go and sell all your goods. Give away all your goods and follow me. I don't like the move where somebody will say, he didn't mean it. He was just trying to teach him. He was trying to show him what's wrong with his heart. I say it was both. I say Jesus was showing him what's wrong with his heart and actually saying, and all things being as they should, this is how you're supposed to live. And maybe striving closer to that is what we should be doing. That's not saying it's easy by any stretch, and I'm not saying it gets you closer, you know, it doesn't get you more brownie points or whatever. I'm just saying this is what the gospel opens up to us. This is what we're born into in faith. Um, it's terribly difficult. Terribly difficult. Frustratingly so. One of the disciples said, Lord, we have given up everything. Mm -hmm. Well, the fun thing is like, well, have you? <laughs> have you given up your life? Well, that's when they say, Lord, we've, look at us, we've given up everything. Well, first of all, it's like, and honestly, it wouldn't be like, See, I don't look at Jesus' response as like, oh, you missed the point. I mean, honestly, in, in my head, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm telling God, I've given up everything. For, you know, I've, I've given up everything to follow you. Have I given up my life? Have I put my life on the line? No, then I haven't. Then I'm lying to God. And see, that's like, that's why I'm like, there's, it's like, it's serious. It's like, it's real. Now, if I was to go out there and put my life on the line, am I being a good steward for my family? Am I, you know, it's like, all right, there's no easy answer. Because of sin, there is no easy answer. That's why I say I'm not telling you how to live or, or well, I guess I am. Um, I'm not telling you exactly what to do because our sin makes things muddy and gross and, and terrible. Um, you know, if, if I tell you to, that my, my go-to example is honor your father and mother. Keep that commandment. What if your father or mother tells you to deny Christ? So you, there is no other God before me, first commandment, Honor your father and mother. Which one? Sin boldly. Sin boldly, yeah. 
You break the, that fourth commandment. You break that commandment boldly to keep the first one. And our pride says, I've done right, but you broke a commandment. <laughs> See, the, the sin gives us a no-win way, no way solution. And that's, that's the problem with a lot of our discourse about that is we, we want to find the right winnable solution. There is none. Because of sin, there is no win-win for us. The win-win is Christ died for us. Getting, hey, bring it back to the beginning. It comes down to the basis. Jesus Christ is God incarnate who walked on this earth to die for us, to rise again, to save us from our sin. Because sin is the problem. That's the issue. We're always, 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 always fighting against it then all this history stuff is how it gets messy and muddy and how things devolve and how we try to fix it and we end up creating more problems and then we try to bring it back and then we unintended consequences and there's all sorts of all this stuff which is what we'll get to with Martin Luther where it's like we're very narrowly like oh it's works righteousness there's so much more <laughs> bigger 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 um, there's so much more going on there so anyway see I had fun don't know about you, and we went over like 25 minutes. So, my apologies to everybody online. Apologies to you for going over, but I had fun. Um, thank you to everybody online. That was awesome. Thank you, you guys. We'll, we'll be back at it next week. All right. <laughs>